deeper analysis of the president's trip abroad and presidential campaign politics, we turn now to our Politics Monday team. That's Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Tamara Keith of NPR. So happy Monday, as they say. Yes. <laughs> President Joe Biden is in Europe, where he's spending four days in three nations, tending to alliances, some of which have been uh, tested by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So, Tam, give us a sense. What's on the agenda and what's at stake? So President Biden is once again trying to make the case that America is back and that America is a trusted partner and that uh, this alliance that uh, that Putin's invasion of Ukraine made stronger is holding tight. Uh, and obviously, as, as we've just heard in this conversation, there's discussion of Sweden being allowed to join NATO. Um, that it appears there has been a breakthrough on that. President Biden had a call with uh, President er Erdogan of, of, um, of Turkey uh, on the flight over. Um, so what's at stake is sort of the shape and size of the alliance, but uh, also uh, domestically, uh, you know, the perception of the war in Ukraine and the U.S. role in that. Right. Well, about that, there is this chorus on the right, the people who say that the U.S. has given Ukraine too much, too much at this point. And even on the left now, there's some progressive voices who have found issue with President Biden's decision to give cluster munitions uh, to Ukraine. Help us understand, sort of distill the, the politics here of Ukraine aid. That's right. I think a lot of it, though, still is div the, the dividing line really is, do you identify more as a Republican? Do you identify more as a Democrat rather than intra-party fights? There are some bubbling, as we know, on the the presidential side, you have Republicans like Donald Trump, like uh, Ron DeSantis, being less supportive of more aid to Ukraine versus what I would call more of the old school Republicans, uh, defense hawks like Mike Pence or Nikki Haley. But fundamentally, what we saw at the very beginning when the invasion happened, support among Democrats and Republicans for the U.S. doing more was equal. Hmm. It took about six months <laughs> for partisanship to really take hold. Which is a long time it, these days. It is a long time yeah. these days that it, it took that long. It but I think, instant. I think that, and, and this is really what's remarkable, if you think back to what, what could be a unifier for Americans in this time of deep polarization, mm. An invasion of a sovereign country by Vladimir Putin would probably be one of those unifying voices, unifying events. And it, and it truly was until it became about Biden, and then it became much less about Putin and much more about, do you really support uh, this president? Mm. And, and Tam, shifting our focus back stateside, President Biden has been trying to persuade Americans that the economy is better than they think it is and that he deserves credit for turning it around. It, it's tough going, though, when the White House is faced with polls like this one. This is a, a Quinnipiac poll. Uh, that shows 55% disapproval. We should say this is in early June. How is this effort, the White House has dubbed this Bidenomics, how is this effort going? Is it yielding results yet? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily yielding results. Views of the economy are polarized just like views on everything else, which is to say uh, that uh, Republicans say the economy is terrible because Joe Biden is president of the United States. So same Republicans thought the economy was incredible under Donald Trump. Um, and the reality is that aside from the, the big pandemic period, the economy is, you know, the, the, the Biden economy has basically recovered to where Trump was pre-pandemic. Um, but there is this divide, this um, this uh, pulling apart, where um, Americans say that their personal economy is pretty great. Like, they feel good about how they're doing. They feel optimistic about their future. How is the U.S. economy doing? Terrible. <laughs> um, and and that's, the, that's the influence of polarization right there. Break that apart. I mean, I, I remember talking to a Democratic pollster who said that people will be asked that question, how's the economy doing? And they'll think... I'm not crazy about my job, not crazy about my boss. That means the economy is doing poorly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I, I was talking for a piece I the other week with a d Democratic strategist who said something similar, which is, I don't trust any of this data, whether it's consumer confidence or do you approve or disapprove, to tell us how people really feel about the economy. The, asking people about the economy, you're asking them, as you point out, about a lot of other things. Hmm. At the same time, there's, there is no doubt that inflation still is taking something of a bite 
out of people's wallets. And that's a lot of what this frustration is. We're not quite yet back to a place where the Fed feels comfortable enough to say, OK, we've gotten, gotten inflation under control. I also think there's a bit of a messenger problem. You know, the other poll number that you'll see next to do, how well do you think uh, President Biden's doing on the economy or other issues is, what do you think about his mental, physical fitness? What do you think about his age? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of concern about that across the board. Obviously, more Republicans feel that way than Democrats. But as a messenger, being able to sell also means people have to see you as being, you know, a, a credible um, person doing that. And I think those two things, you can't necessarily separate worries about his age with worries about how well he's handling the economy and will handle the economy if he's reelected. We've got a couple of minutes left. I want to fit in uh, what's happening on the Republican side of, le of the ledger here with Ron DeSantis. His poll numbers have slid. His competition is growing. The head of his or a spokesperson for his super PAC said last week, we are way behind. He was asked about this during an appearance on Fox News. And here's what he said. <laughs> oh, Maria, these are narratives. The media does not want me to be the nominee. I think that's very, very clear. But this is not something that, um, you know, I ever expected to just snap fingers and all of a sudden, you know, you win seven months before anyone happens. You got to earn it and you got to yeah. work. And it requires a lot of toil and tears and sweat. And we're going to do that. So he's blaming the media for creating false expectations. And he's saying, give my campaign time to do its thing. That sounds pretty reasonable. <laughs> it, it does sound reasonable. We are very far out. And you are right. If you look back at previous elections, plenty of folks who had been written off or not even paid attention to at all ended up either coming close or winning the nomination. What's different about this is that Donald Trump is essentially an incumbent. Mm -hmm. And beating an incumbent is a very, thing to, a very difficult thing to do. It's not 2015. It is, a, we have a, a party that is much more Trump organized and Trump centric than it was obviously back then. And he's much more popular, considerably more popular among Republicans. So the, the threat, the, the, the sort of way to beat Donald Trump, you think about it as this very narrow gap, right? How do you find a way through that? DeSantis is trying to figure out his way going to the right of him on cultural issues. We've got some other candidates going to the right of him on security issues. Obviously, Chris Christie going right at him on the, uh, the indictments. None of it seems to be uh, penetrating his popularity. So, Tam, is this a two-person race between on the Republican side between Trump and DeSantis, as DeSantis says it is? Well, DeSantis would sure like it to be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, there are a lot of other candidates. And, and what DeSantis has said is, you know, don't look at the national polls. Look at how I'm doing in these early states where I'm putting a lot of emphasis. What we don't know yet, because there isn't great polling out of these early states, um, a lot of other candidates on that list have that same strategy, which is, let's just win Iowa and then knock Trump. You know, if Trump looks like he's weak, then, right. then we can take him on. So it's Iowa. It's New Hampshire. You know, it's early. Well, before we go, I want to mention the uh, Congressional Women's Softball Game. Members of Congress play members of the D.C. Press Corps. I hear that you two are on the, on the D.C. Press Corps <laughs> we team. We are on the team pitcher. Catcher. Catcher. There you go, as are a number of our beloved uh, yes. NewsHour uh, staff members, team members here. Uh, we should say that people can donate online because it's a fundraiser. It raises right. money. It raises money for uh, breast cancer, the Young Survival Coalition. It's raised over $3 million since we started this game about 15 years ago. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And I'll be watching on Wednesday. On the live stream.